In 2005, the solar system was turned upside down. A body larger than the planet Pluto was discovered far beyond the orbit of Neptune. Eris, and later its moon Dysnomia, led to Pluto's demotion as a planet. What is this world like, and could we colonise it? Hi everyone, Vega here, and in the next of our solar system series, we're looking at the dwarf world in more details, so let's get to it. Eris was the Greek goddess of strife, discord, contention and rivalry. She delighted in human bloodshed and haunted the battlefield. She antagonised and caused pain to all who stood before her. Her daughter, Dysnomia, was a deity of lawlessness and poor civil order. She was a companion of injustice, ruin and violence. Together, of course, they are the strange distant worlds that changed our solar system as we know it. So how far are Eris and Dysnomia? In this graphic we see in billions of kilometres, Eris is extremely far. Its strange orbit means that at times it intersects the orbit of its fellow dwarf planet, Pluto, but for the most part it's a long way further out, between 38 and 97 astronomical units, or some 5.7 billion kilometres at its closest, and as many as 14.5 billion kilometres distant from the Sun. Eris's apparent magnitude of 18.7 makes it just bright enough to be detected by amateur telescopes. Its average distance of 68 astronomical units means that it's 13 light hours travel from Eris to planet Earth. Eris's orbit is gigantic and takes around 558 years to make one trip around the Sun. Its day, however, is similar to the Earth's at 25.9 hours. Interestingly, Eris reached Ophelia, or furthest distance from the Sun, at around the year 1977. Since then, it's been slowly travelling towards us until the year 2256, when it reaches its perihelion, or its closest distance to the Sun, and it actually in, will be inside the orbit of Pluto, although it never actually interacts with either Pluto nor the larger body of Neptune. We can at this point only imagine what it might be like to step out and take a walk on the surface of Eris. Steep white cliffs or chasmata intrude a small valley, perhaps created in an earlier time during formation. Its albedo is extremely high, meaning its surface likely to be extremely white, and perhaps similar to Saturn's sixth largest moon, Enceladus. We know that it is composed largely of rocky materials, but it also contains methane and lysis. The presence of methane, given methane's volatile nature, suggests that Eris has always resided in the distant reaches of the solar system. Or, alternatively, something inside Eris is launching these gases into its fragile atmosphere. When Eris was initially discovered, it was thought to be bigger than Pluto, meaning a new definition of planets was required. In a twist of fate, it is now actually believed to be slightly smaller than Pluto in radius, yet substantially larger in the mass, as much as even 28%. We see Eris as the 17th largest body in the solar system, and in a class of size, along with the Jovian moons of Io and Europa, or the faraway bodies of Triton and Pluto, or indeed our own moon. Eris has a high density and radioactive decay inside the core, could mean that it holds an internal ocean of liquid water. This coupled with its high albedo means that the presence of ice on its surface, it could be a superb target for colonisation, especially given it's actually currently approximating our own planet. As I said before, Eris makes its closest approach in the year 2256. Note that down in your notepads, because it could coincide perfectly with the necessary advances in technology and capabilities by then. Of course, to set up a colony, we will need to first shield ourselves from cosmic rays. Perhaps in the future we will develop techniques with materials like graphene to shield us. It's also worth remembering, of course, that some of the radiation would be stopped by Eris itself and also we nestled beneath cliffs and crevices. Illumination would also be a problem on Eris, but imagine the scenes in our floodlight world inside the dome, where trees and people cohabit with a view to Eris's tiny moon dysnomia and a realistic day-night cycle. So, how long should we expect it to take us on a journey? First of all, on current speeds, they're probably not enough. Voyager probe travels at just 61,000 km per hour. It would approach the dwarf world of Pluto and take as many as 13 years, depending on Pluto's position in the sky. We'll no doubt have faster probes by the year 2256. Momentum here travels at some 1 million kilometers per hour, or 1,000% of a light speed. 
its transit time to Pluto is some 307 days at the farthest distance, and finally, beyond to Eris, in just below one year, the closest approach. Technology, of course, will improve, and the imaginary craft at velocity now, travelling at 0.1% of light speed, is much more realistic for safe human transit. It reaches Eris in around 57 hours, or 6 days at Aphelion. This is no doubt a better craft for the fragile human frame. Eris's tiny moon of Dysnomia is the second largest moon of a dwarf planet after Pluto's moon Charon. Its orbit is very close to its own world, at only 37,000 kilometres away, and has a diameter of 650 kilometres, which means someone staring up at the surface of Eris would be able to see it quite clearly and have a great view of both the Milky Way and Dysnomia at the same time. It's likely, but not certain, to be spherical. It's a very dark coloured surface, which is stark contrast to the pair of planets of Eris, and it indeed is a mystery for, for us to consider. Eris is in the Cetus constellation, but is on its way to Pisces, which is my, actually my own star sign. It will arrive in Pisces by the year 2036. At two thirds of the Moon's diameter and one third of its volume, all the bodies in the asteroid belt could actually fit inside Eris. And unlike Pluto and Triton, it's thought not to have many red tholins on its surface. This may be related to its extreme temperature fluctuations, of minus 217 degrees Celsius at its hottest, to as low as minus 243 when it reaches Ophelia. It could be due to seismic activity replenishing its surface, like that on that Enceladus or Triton, but we don't really know why tholins are not there. Eris has roughly the same surface area as the country of Russia, and indeed its cold temperatures mean that it's not the only thing the two places have in common. Someone standing on the surface of Eris would be slightly heavier than Pluto, but somewhat less than other bodies like Ganymede, Titan, or indeed our own moon. It's not great for human habitation, but it is better than zero gravity. One of the biggest difficulties in colonisation of Eris would of course be luminosity. At 40 astronomical units, despite what we may think, the sun would still provide some degree of light. In fact, NASA has a great website known as Pluto Time, where you can actually find the time of day in the area with the light intensity on Pluto at midday. I'll link that in the description. The problem is that Eris, as we've discussed, at Aphelion can reach almost three times further away than Pluto. That's fine while Eris is in at Pluto distance, but for centuries this would not be the case. Indeed, one of our finest moments on our own world, which you may agree, is when winter turns to summer and we see a much higher light intensity. It fills us with hope and warmth for the future, whereas if we were on Eris, we might be facing centuries of near darkness. The goddess Eris wanted to sow dystopia for humanity. Her daughter, Dysnomia, was brought into being just for that purpose. But like the gods before her, her fate was bound to fluctuations in our universe. Eris's strange orbit just so happens, and for the next 250 years, it approaches us just like the headlights of a car would do on a distant mountain. Maybe by then, humanity will have learned to deal and organise against dystopian visions. Maybe, just maybe, the beauty of Eris and its moon Dysnomia will join us and form part of our future solar system civilization. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to check out some of our other videos on our solar system series, where we look at places like Triton or Venus, Mars, Ganymede or even Titan. If you like this kind of content, don't forget to subscribe, because it does help the channel grow. We recently hit 200 subscribers, but as I've said before, we could always use more. So don't be shy and, and I'll see you on the next one.